Hello. Good afternoon, Savannah. You're muted. Unmute. Uh, Hello. Hi. Good afternoon. Hi, Savannah. How are you? I'm doing so well. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Thank you so much for agreeing to speak with me today. I was literally just about to say the same thing. I'm so happy to be here and so honored that you want to talk to me. Absolutely. Uh, well, I, I don't have my camera on because unfortunately I have an eye infection. So uh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Are you doing all right? <laughs> yes, I. It's just watering profusely, and it's just oh. it, it's very irritated, and I'm I'm just trying to figure that out. But um, I just wanted to one congratulate you on all of your hard work, and you know we appreciate the commitment that you have and your artistic contributions and and everything that you're doing. So thank you. Thank you. No, thank you. It's um, uh, it feels undeserved, but I really appreciate hearing that, and it's it's I'm I'm grateful. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. So okay, well let's get started. Uh, I just want to put on the record today is August fourteenth, two thousand and twenty. My name is Dr. Rhonda Jones, speaking with uh, Savannah Thorpe. And she is an artist at, uh, in Greensboro, and this is part of the Black Lives Matter Archive, a project between uh, Dr. Tara Green and the Special Collections Unit at uh, University of North Carolina in Greensboro. So, mm -hmm. uh, Savannah, if you just want to start, tell me about your background, where you're from, and just kind of um, how you got here. What influenced you? Uh, okay, great. Yes, ma'am. Well, to dive in, um, I am a musician. I went to UNCG uh, in the School of Music. I studied um, ethnomusicology, although technically it was a BA in music. Um, but I've, I've, since I was 16 years old, always knew that I had a, a deep and profound um, fascination, feels too trite, <laughs> um, love, appreciation, and admiration for the human experience and the way that we like to express ourselves. So I spend a lot of time thinking about um, the arts and expression and, and how and why we do what we do um, as artists. So I thought for a while that I would go into academia um, and I have really sternly taken a hard left away from academia. Um, feeling like it is maybe a little too privileged um, as an institution. And I began making art in Greensboro um, and really ingratiating myself into different artist scenes here, um, doing everything that I could to be um, supportive and to, to make sure that my art was making room for and uplifting all of the voices that I felt were most necessary right now. And um, I, yeah, I, I, so anyway, I, I guess, Long story short, um, after being on the Greensboro Arts Council and working with the Folk Festival, um, helping curate So Far Sounds for a few years, I found all of these beautiful artists who were standing next to me during the protests and on the front lines, and we came together and decided that uh, artists needed to keep talking about this. And so here we are, <laughs> doing just that, talking about it. Thank you. Thank you. So growing up, who were the most influential people in your community? Ooh. Um, my grandparents, I, I've been so fortunate that I, I, ha I actually have six grandparents, three sets of grandparents, because my dad's parents were divorced and remarried. And um, I, I was so lucky that I got to have all of them up until I was like 22 years old and every single one of them, but especially my, um, my grandmothers, all three of them were deeply musical. And, um, and artistic and expressive and, and really encouraged me to be just that. Um, and I was really lucky that my grandparents, when my mom was young, living in Wilmington, they grew up during the race riots and uh, found themselves on the right side of history, at least what I believe to be the right side of history and, and being helpful and, and having these difficult conversations about um, race and justice and social issues with us from the time that we were really young. So it's it's always been a part of my internal monologue, and and I'm really grateful for that. That's been like one of the most encouraging, uplifting sources of both expression and like morality for me. 
great. Thank you for sharing that. So do you mind me asking how old you are? I'm 25. You're 25. <laughs> okay, great. So what would you tell your 15-year-old self? Uh, <laughs> I don't, oh, uh, no, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, oh, keep going. <laughs> hey, we'll that's, come back to that. <laughs> don't just, I would, well, I think that's what I would tell my 15 year old self though, is don't stop. <laughs> okay, great. It is keep, keep going. <laughs> so, so tell me about your music. Ooh. <laughs> Um, so I, uh, am a musician. I started playing the piano when I was a little kid, but according to everybody else in my life, I've been singing since before I could talk. Um, it just is so innate to me, but my music is deeply personal to me. I, I, I play a lot of jazz and blues, um, and I grew up in that tradition. So it's been really exciting to sort of explore those in Greensboro because we had the School of Jazz. And even though uh, I did get a degree in classical voice, I was always so fascinated with other traditions. I've been so fortunate that UNCG has offered or did offer at the time when I was there um, excursions out into other opportunities. So I've played everything from the, the gamelan um, to the sitar to practicing old time traditions to jazz ensembles. And, um, and I've tried my best to immerse myself into um, every possible avenue of exploring new sounds. So my music is sort of a, an amalgamation of all of those things and trying to find sounds and techniques that we can uh, know the history of, love, appreciate, uplift, and, um, and respect. And then also use that to make beautiful new narratives about togetherness. Um, yeah, I think, I think that, oh, how do I sum that up? <laughs> <laughs> so I might be as close up? as I can get. Did you come from a musical family? No. <laughs> no. Well, okay, that's, um, <laughs> uh, I come from a family that is not afraid of expressing themselves. I come from a family where, like, we always have music on in the background. We're always dancing in the kitchen. We're always, you know, jamming on a, on an old guitar, but, no one ever um, called themselves a musician. I think that like the, my experience understanding of musicianship for my family has always been, and artistry for my family too, has always been that this is just another facet of the human experience and that, that it is the, the expression of humanhood always comes out creatively in some capacity and that that's just a necessity. And so I got really fortunate that um, I get to call myself an artist and that I, I get to participate in culture this way. Uh, but it took me a long time to get to the point before I did call myself an artist and a musician. Even as I was getting a degree in music, I didn't call myself a musician. I don't know. <laughs> did you take classes as a child, music lessons? No. <laughs> I was so very how did you learn adamant. how to play the piano, the gamelan, the sitar? Like, how, how, how does that happen? <laughs> I was, um, uh, what my mom politely called convicted which is i think like a very kind way of saying stubborn um i i very much wanted uh, uh, for example i rejected coloring books because somebody already drew that picture i didn't want i didn't want to take lessons i wanted to draw my own pictures i wanted to sit at the piano we always had instruments in the house again it's so weird to me to say that my family isn't musical um but we had an old piano in the house, this old upright that was never in tune. And I used to sit at it for hours on end and just pluck away. And thank God I have the most patient siblings on earth who would sit and let me play and doodle and, and explore my musicianship, even when it was truthfully probably terrible because I was all of four or five or six years old. But I, I was so, so lucky that I, I was encouraged. Um, so I, I learned by trying and playing in a very innocent and brave and courage, you know, like I hate to use the word courageous, but like fearless kind of way. So I don't know. <laughs> so in, in, in going to UNCG, did you think you said you wanted to be an academic, an academician, mm -hmm. but did you want to be a performer? Like, did you want no. to? No. Not Still no. Still absolutely not. <laughs> No, no. Um, my my musicianship is so deeply a part of who I am, and I 
don't feel comfortable giving it away. There's something about being a musician, standing on stage, music happens between, somewhere between the stage and the audience, this magical thing, musicking. Um, and it's the same way with art, you know, you, you have to give it away and you have to be prepared to give it away. Um, but it is uh, extremely vulnerable. And I like keeping it for myself. I'm very selfish in that way. <laughs> um, so, no, but I do love uh, music and I do love finding other ways to continue to explore expression and things like that. So I did for a long time think that I would go into academia and study music history and find ways to uplift, uplift voices that, that did have the courage to be musicians. Because it takes a hell of a lot of courage. <laughs> It absolutely does. That's why we commend you so much for the work that you do. So do you write music as well? I do. Um, on occasion, you know, as it, as it needs to come out of me, um, I, I allow myself to write. I don't consider myself a singer-songwriter. Um, I express in every way. I'm very much, I'm just as much a dancer and a visual artist and an actor and a poet and a writer as I am a musician. Um, so in whatever way feels convicted in the moment, I definitely, <laughs> I definitely play. Okay, that's fantastic. So you basically come from a family that's very politically motivated and engaged mm. and you are very, you know, empathetic. What was the first protest you remember? Your own personal experience. You talked about your parents' experience. What about your experience? Yeah. I'm trying to dig back as far as I can. Um, I remember being deeply politically engaged because both of my parents are. I remember, I think it might have been right after Bush, my mom and I went down to go witness protests, but I, I don't think that I was truly protesting. I think my first- Which, which Bush? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> the more recent one. <laughs> George Walker. Okay. <laughs> I know. Um, George W. <laughs> um, so, but I don't think that I, that that was, I think that like I was, I was participating by proxy um, because I was there with my mom echoing her sentiments. I think the first time that I took my own sentiments um, to a protest was after Trayvon Martin was shot. And there was a protest on UNCG campus. And I was a freshman. And I remember hearing the chants. I was living in the Grogan dorm at the time and hearing the chants from one side of campus and seeing all of the little social media chatter about how it was going to happen. And I was so scared. And then all of a sudden, I was so unafraid. <laughs> and I... I just remember I changed into all black so quickly and I sprinted down college, how, um, college Ave and made it to the ECU in time. And that was one of my first protests. And I remember we sat in the, we went into the, oh, what the registrar's office where that, where that building is. I can't remember what it's called right across from the EUC. And I think that that's the first time that I remember protesting all of 18 years old on my own without, without echoing anybody else's sentiments. Did you go alone or were you with friends? I went alone, um, which was also terrifying. But uh, I don't think that you're ever really alone at a protest. <laughs> you know, you definitely find, you find your people. And if nothing else, you're there because somebody was alone. And um, me being alone in that moment is not uh, important, I guess. Seems, seems strange to say, use the word important in that moment. So but I what, do you, what do you read to inspire oh. you? You are sitting on a stack of books right now. I'll read you the titles. Uh, one is an introduction to humanity, or human perspective, the past and present. Um, one is laughter behind the mud. A bunch of anthologies is the answer. <laughs> I was double majoring in, um, in uh, anthropology as well, and I, I tend to really gravitate towards anthologies um, from all over, but I think every single one of these is, is an ethnography of some kind. Oh, yeah. D random, random things. And then a little bit of Marx, a little bit of 
everything, some conservative rhetoric in here too. We're currently trying to start a nonprofit called House of Lax, and so I'm trying to be as fully rounded in this moment as possible. So you still are being an academician. Woo! <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm I'm a I'm a nerd through and through as it were but the one of the primary principles that we're really working towards with House of Blacks I truly I think I've just gone into applied studies um one of the things that we're working very hard with with the House of Blacks and bringing artists together is making sure that all of this information this this vast wealth of data and conclusions that people have been writing about forever becomes more uh digestible and accessible and because obviously I, I really enjoy sitting down with a thick dense book and having my thesaurus next to me and looking up words in the dictionary. Um, I've sort of taken it upon myself to dissect some of these larger, a little bit more difficult works and to come up with summaries that are that are easier and more approachable so that so that they can be really accessible to the entire community. Um, I'm really passionate about making knowledge available. You, it sounds like you're forming an academy. <laughs> it's, um, I'm not sure that I'm forming an academy so much as I am um, offering the truth. I think, uh, I think the academy does a fine job of keeping it deeply, I hate to use the word hidden because it's not like anybody, it's, 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 it's stuffed behind this rhetoric that is so unattainable and and unapproachable that that the truth and the conclusions on their own i don't want to offer my own conclusions or obviously i'm biased and i will be swaying some opinions but i i'm trying really hard and all of us are in the house of blacks trying really hard to stay as unbiased as possible because i think we really believe that if only you knew the truth and the facts that you would be able to come to the same conclusions that we have and that we really don't need to tell you how to feel um so um, but also we can take that with a grain of salt because we are young, convicted, motivated liberals. So <laughs> so what kind of activities do you promote with this organization? Mm -hmm. So I'm the, uh, one of the co-founders and director of programming. Um, we have a few different programs that we're working on right now and that we will continue to roll out. Currently, um, each month is focusing on a different theme. So um, August is police brutality and the justice system as a whole. We're talking about um, the Insurrection Act, what gave Donald Trump the right to put, um, and also the governors the right to call in the, um, the feds and, and state troopers and things like that. Um, we're talking about uh, privatized prison systems, things like that. Each month focusing on a different topic. September is education. Um, we talk about healthcare, child welfare, principles of civil disobedience. We're going into um, working with the UN as a, as a cultural consultant, talking about your right to culture and uh, the 30 human rights that are, that are being promoted by them in their preamble. But that is a long way of saying, we're really trying to dissect um, the idea of privilege and specifically white privilege and white supremacy through every single facet of our culture and this larger system as a whole that has built up the foundation of our American society. And ways that we want to talk about that are by taking artists who, uh, whether we like it or not, speak a truth and irreparable truth. We don't necessarily have to agree with that truth, but are trying to express a truth about what they're going through and what they see our society going through as a whole and helping them by uplifting those voices, hosting podcasts where they can, where they can talk about their experiences of expression, um, hosting galleries. We're currently working with the Greensboro History Museum to open up their gallery right now um, that had all of the plywood uh, murals from downtown. And then we're working on um, a couple different projects that will go online and hopefully in person once COVID is over, oh my goodness, <laughs> where we will be hosting pop-up shows um, that will act simultaneously as moments of education where we can offer all of the research that we've done, but also as a protest because the act of being educated and, and the act of expressing is in and of itself at least for most of the black voices that are working with us, extremely full of, of, um, of protest, <laughs> you know? So 
hosting galleries to answer your question. Sorry, that was such a long roundabout no, way of saying it. Thank you for the explanation. Thank you. Yeah, hosting galleries, um, hosting concerts, hosting ciphers, trying to engage our community with the artists who will be backed with facts in order to um, have larger difficult conversations. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, thank you. So how many people are involved in this organization? Five. Five. Five of us. Five of us. Um, myself, Maya Camille, who is actually currently in Israel, she's doing some research with us um, between the Israeli-Palestine conflict and trying to see what kind of peace and conflict resolutions can come through music and music making. Uh, she's another ethnomusicologist like I am from Bard University. Justin Harrington, who is a, a banjo player who also raps. He um, makes a beautiful argument about how rap is folk music and folk music is music for the people. And so there's this beautiful connection between the banjo that is this West African instrument and, um, and, and rap music and you know connecting the lines between the front porch and the stoop, which I think is really beautiful. Um, Selena Little, who is an absolute powerhouse of a woman who's currently getting her master's in um, art administration from Berkeley University. She just got in and had her orientation. We're very proud of her. Um, and then Virginia Holmes, who is a self-proclaimed project baby. She grew up in Hampton Homes and she's a, a modernist uh, visual artist who works really hard to promote Greensboro history and is, um, Virginia Holmes is and has been at the helm of every single protest in Greensboro. And truly, like, I think we are all standing behind her <laughs> in solidarity with her, so. So how did you all find each other? Me? <laughs> um, I, Just how did you connect? Like, yeah, like, yeah, I, so I, because I had been, right after college, I had the great fortune of, working with um, the Greensboro Arts Council, with the North Carolina Folk Festival, going back into when it was the National Folk Festival, excuse me, um, and then working with different artist organizations like the Artist Block and So Far Sounds. Um, I met all four of these people and others in, uh, in all of those different scenarios. I made these connections over the last three or four years. And then after the protests in late May, where things became extremely desperate for the Black Lives Matter movement. And we were, we were outside every single day and facing the police every single day. Um, and everything was shut down. I sort of assembled my, my Avengers as it were. And um, some of the community members that I knew could be helpful. And I just tried to get all of the right people in one place to have a conversation about it and what was going on and how we could be more organized and more together. And those four other people we're also in the room when it happened. We sat in, <laughs> we sat uh, in the back of a closed bar, just like, I think there were like 10 of us, um, all various community members and leaders in our own right and in our own circles and collectives. And um, we formed a plan to host the big protests um, that, that ended up being extremely successful and a couple smaller ones like Black Elm Street that were just for artists. And then I think from there, we, we did those in 14 days. And then after that, um, after the Black Elm Street protest, which was our Juneteenth protest, the, most, the, the last one that we did actually, uh, the four of us, five of us, I guess, total before Maya left for Israel, all got in a room and said, hey, this feels really good. Do you want to keep doing this? Because I feel like I found my life's work. And if you're on board, then I'm on board. And everyone sort of mutually said, yeah, no, I'm on board. And, um, and we kept going and we kept dreaming. And then we kept doing and working and trying to find ways to make it happen because building a nonprofit is hard. <laughs> um, but we just pulled together as many resources as we could. We're all really lucky to have extremely um, helpful resources that are really ready and willing and quick to give their time to us. So I don't know. My next question, who's mentoring you and guiding you through this process? We have been so fortunate. Each of us come from, um, uh, I'm so, you know, it's sort of like 
I don't know, this seems cheesy. It's like each of us are coming from different specific circles and councils. So we get to pull from a lot of different resources. And one of the first things that we did was we made a resource map full of the people that we knew we could call on. Um, the first person was our fiscal sponsor. Uh, her name is Dr. Dina, who works with, um, she's actually the, co the founder of Imani Works, which is a nonprofit in Virginia. She hosts musicians all the time and she was a resource of Justin Harrington's, who's another one of our co-founders that I spoke about earlier. And uh, she gave us our first grant, which helped us um, get through LegalZoom. And she's been one of our great mentors. And we've had quite a few others. Um, we've been really fortunate, name dropping seems tacky, but we've been really fortunate to have people like Rain and Giddens um, and some of the people with the Folk Festival really come through and offer their guidance and support. Um, our board of directors right now, which I'm extremely proud of, is just packed with exclusively black women who have their PhDs. So um, we've, been, we've been really surrounded by, by light and, and, and encouragement. And that's been profound for me. <laughs> so how has COVID-19 affected this work? <laughs> uh miss rona she is the worst um we originally our and this will be programming this is on the docket for the end of 2021 and beginning of 22 if we're lucky um we are really desperate to travel from city to city hosting pop-up shows as protests where we take um, what we did in Greensboro was we took uh, 10 musicians, we paired each musician with a different facet of the African American descent, talking about everything from police brutality, education, um, health and wellness, child welfare, and financial literacy. Uh, we backed them with statistics and literature, and then we placed them up and down Elm Street, and we had people rotate through uh, the protesters, as it were, like the, the people who found themselves in the middle of this demonstration without realizing it, rotating through and watching these 30-minute sets where the artists talked about these disparities and how these disparities specifically affected them. While we did that, we were, and organizing that and having that go on, we were also collecting information from the people who were there on the ground, the protesters who were there trying to find their way through this extremely complicated, difficult situation. It, it ought not to seem so complicated. Obviously, Black Lives Matter, and that should be the only truth we know. But I think, de you know, deconstructing the idea of privilege, um, it, if you haven't been taught before, takes some time. So. We, while we were there, were gathering demands that we wanted to make of the city. And, and that was extremely successful and helpful to be able to unite Greensboro under common demands that all of us could get behind and all of us understood why we needed to make those demands and why it mattered. So a goal of ours that we were gonna get into immediately was starting to go to some of the bigger cities, go to Charleston and Atlanta and uh, Detroit and, and, and all kinds of different cities with various degrees of um, need and also various degrees of artist communities that we knew we could tap into and hosting similar pop-up shows like that. But unfortunately, because of coronavirus, uh, we didn't feel like it was safe or ethical to be asking people to come down in droves to a protest, um, especially one that would require funding and, and um, most likely city support in order to block off streets and things like that. So we've had to postpone those things, um, things like our galleries that we've been working really hard on and, and our exhibits all have to go online in some capacity. And it's hard. Um, it's hard to feel the intimacy of being next to somebody and, and experiencing their reaction and, and feeling that that overwhelming group think that happens when you're protesting next to somebody or you're experiencing art next to somebody or you're feeling and being empathetic and, and tapping into something larger than yourself. It's, it's hard to feel that through a screen. So we've been um, lucky that it's offered us time to get all of our crap together uh, and devastated that it feels like it slowed us down because all of us are eager to be doing the work now. 
had you thought about doing live webinars yes. since you can't travel? <laughs> yes, and we've had some luck. Um, uh, we have done a few of those things and we are going to continue to do those things. Um, Justin just did a, a TED talk and is performing with the, well, the Folk Festival this year online all the while talking about House of Lax and our mission and things like that. And, and we've been really lucky to be on a few different panels for webinars. Um, but I think right now that requires us to talk a lot. Um, things like this require me to talk a lot. And although I'm so grateful to be talking and so glad to be able to do things like this, the, the impetus for everything that we're doing is to offer our artists a platform and to, to hear from the people who are, who are being affected by this. So although it's great to be thought leaders in this, in this moment and we're humbled by the opportunity to be hosting and curating these conversations, I'm so eager to fall back into the background and to be able to let our artists really do what they do best. What were your first thoughts about Black Lives Matter? <laughs> 2013, I was um, 18 years old and I didn't understand. I am glad that All Lives Matter never came out of my mouth, but I think my gut reaction because of the the privilege that I had been raised in, even being politically engaged as a young woman, um, and and even feeling somewhat educated, uh, I still was. Oh, I, I was so completely blind, and I'm glad that I was offered the opportunity to grow and to change that perspective. I quickly dug into as many books as I could, and and I'm glad that that has changed but my gut reaction i think like most of white america was what do you mean <laughs> uh and somewhat innocently my what do you mean was from the sentiment of of course they do yes of course they do but but i didn't understand why we had to say it out loud and why we needed to be affirming that so fervently and so desperately and i don't think that i'm the exception in that and uh something it, it is a privilege to say of course they do and it is a privilege to be optimistic now to say that they will continue to so yeah not great so seven years later how has it changed you in every possible way um i feel I can't, I can't stop thinking about that sentiment of you don't, you, you, like the more you learn, the more you realize that you don't know anything, what, like at all. <laughs> I thought that I was a deeply empathetic person, but even just the covert racism that had been built into my mind and built into my every action, you know, down to the tiniest details um, that have now been unlearned and relearned um, or the new skills that have been relearned and, and the new perspectives in every way and in every facet of my life, I feel like I am a much more entirely empathetic person, but I also understand that there, in order to be empathetic, you must fully understand what it feels like to be in that position, which is something that I never will be able to be. Um, I'll never know what it feels like to be discriminated against or, or to be in positions like that. So uh, I, think if, I think the most profound effect it has had on me is just that I am entirely humbled by this entire experience and that I, I have an, an, a reverence, an absolute reverence for the lives around me that I don't think that I had before, not out of um, malice, but out of ignorance. So what do you say to that person that says, but all lives matter? That if all lives really matter, then we shouldn't have a problem saying black lives matter. I have such a hard time combating that argument. I, I, it's difficult, you know, you can be so convicted in your ideas and you can know what is right, but um, how to argue against it is, is I am not the eloquent one. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I struggle with that. But I think to those people who still say that, you know, the the only answer is, if all lives matter, then black lives have to matter. And there's no way that we can, that we should be, that we have any right to be devastated by hearing that news. 
I also, though, I'm a firm believer that if you're still at this point in 2020 saying that all lives matter, that you're doing it adamantly, because what you're really trying to say is that all lives don't matter. So to them, I say, fuck you, but oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> They say smart people say how you feel say how you feel (laughs) i hope so (laughs) oh my mom's gonna be so mad (laughs) so so other than the activism and the education are you involved politically in terms of writing your representative or going to voter registration drives heck yeah (laughs) um personally and also like you know in in my and, and the work that we're doing with House of Blacks, both is absolutely true. Um, we've, as a whole, been working really hard towards that. But for me, one of my favorite things to do is to compose template emails that I can send around to other people. Um, I am unafraid. <laughs> I think, you know, going back to that idea of I learned how to play and sing um, because I just wasn't scared of playing and singing, I, I feel the same way about being engaged i i love to talk to people about these things and so i'm the first person to stand up and 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 to make templates or make phone calls or you know go to these rallies ask difficult weird uncomfortable questions force people into corners and be like hello (laughs) but truly explain to me how you think this policy is going to work um (laughs) and uh and to be convicted in those ways Yes, I firmly believe that we have to vote and we are currently working on a plan that I feel like maybe I shouldn't actually talk about, but to um, to not only make sure that people in Greensboro are registered to vote, to make sure that they are equipped with the information that they need to be able to vote appropriately, um, not to sway their opinion of who to vote for, but to make sure that they are engaged at all. The new districts that... Uh, are a nightmare. (laughs) Um, We're pushing back against those too, because I still don't think that these districts are entirely appropriately drawn. Um, And, uh, and really with this current election coming up with Trump's postmaster living just down the street in Irving Park, um, we went to the Greensboro History Museum and got a list that is really stunning. It was a list of 650 names that were black names in Warnersville who were kept from voting in Greensboro. And we plan on doing a demonstration with those names to to really talk about voter suppression and principles of civil disobedience and why and how that has been a systemic problem, not just in North Carolina, but in Greensboro specifically. Um, And I'm really excited to let him know how I feel about it. (laughs) So (laughs) we'll see how it goes. Are you all doing any work with the census? Uh, professionally, I'm no. Personally, yes. Professionally, no. Um, although maybe we should. That's a great point. I'm going to write that down. <laughs> <laughs> the first one is free. After that, it will cost you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I will. Your name is going in the credits, I promise. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, we um, uh, personally... A few of my friends actually are working with the census going around and they're the people who are knocking on doors, um, making sure that people have filled out their census. I was filled mine out so quickly. <laughs> um, I'm adamant that the census is, is, is going to be helpful, although adamant and weary, but whatever. So what do you tell the young people who say, my vote doesn't count and, and why should I bother? Or not just young people, anyone. Everyone. And it's difficult because I am scared that mine won't too. Um, I share that fear. I, I, I think in our last election, we saw that sometimes your vote doesn't. Um, and I'm really worried in this election, speaking candidly, because hopefully whoever sees this will be seeing it in the future and we will have our optimism rewarded but i think um it's uh, i too am hesitant i think we have to try for the principle we have to vote for the principle i think you know even if we are unsuccessful not voting 
that silence can be so dangerous. That silence in every way um, shows, shows apathy. Like we don't care, but the truth is that we do. And we are all extremely concerned about what's going on right now. I think most people are concerned. And so to the people who say that my vote don't matter, my vote don't matter, my vote doesn't matter. Um, the answer is that even, even if, even if the election doesn't go the way we want it to, even if the election is somehow suppressed or whatever, the real numbers will be there <laughs> and they matter. Um, even if it's just to say that we tried anyway, that there is a chunk of people who are trying anyway. Um, and I, I think that that is a powerful, powerful statement um, that we get to make. Our voices get to be heard even if they are meek and mild. <laughs> subservient to times <laughs> it's <laughs> it's difficult it's difficult to know the answer but I, I still think the principle of the matter is that even if we feel like it's a losing battle we try anyway and that's what I keep echoing to the people to everybody that I see and meet we tried anyway and it's much more important that we've tried than it is that we lost you can't see me but I'm nodding in affirmation I don't want to interrupt you. <laughs> I don't want to say, go on, sister, amen. <laughs> I'm really holding okay. back here. I'm just biting my tongue. <laughs> I'm glad that you share that sentiment. It's so difficult. It's hard to know what to do. And it's, it's hard to convince somebody that their vote matters when we've been shown over and over again that not only does your vote not matter, your life doesn't matter. Your, your, your person, your, your wealth, your knowledge, your culture, your community, everything. And, and I don't just mean black lives. I mean, you know, LGBTQ lives, the intersectionality of all of this, women in most cases, it's, it's difficult. And we've been shown, you know, the, the, the legislative branch has disappointed us and have written these laws in a very specific way in order to make us, um, and I say us as a whole, like society at large, although I, am, I have so much privilege, so not entirely us, but, but to, to oppress and suppress and, and the judiciary system, don't even get me started. We know how that's going. And the executive branch, well, we have a backlog of his tweets to know how he feels. So I, it's difficult. It's difficult to encourage, but it's, I think, I think, you know, the privilege of hope is something that I have and I'm, I'm cling to and practice with reckless abandon. <laughs> so have I'll keep open. Have you had to make any sacrifices in your work or your personal life? I, not as many as others. I am really lucky and it is luck that I was born into the family that I was. I know people who have lost their family. I know people who have been, you know, as our, at the protests, as our photos have been taken, standing in front of cops, my face screaming and yelling and, and, and right below it. And we know like a headline says everything, even though we were the peaceful protesters, right below that it says violence and looting in Greensboro. And, and that happened to Virginia too. And that happened to all of us and our names and our, our, our identities got leaked and I know people who whose families have disowned them I know people who still haven't recovered from expired mace in their lungs and have infections and and can't breathe to this day I mean it's been almost two months I know people who have had to move a, a mom with three children who had to move because her house was exposed to the press and the media and then she was getting death threats you know I, I know people who have had it far worse than I have, who, who, who have had their, their place of employment called and who tried to get them fired from, from their dream jobs as you know, young 27 something year olds who, who are now having to defend to this older generation. Like, no, I promise I can still do work and also be politically engaged at the same time. And I, I have been so lucky. Um, the sacrifices that I have had to make, although there have been some, I, it's been so small in comparison to what I know has happened. So it doesn't even feel relevant to talk about those as sacrifices. They're more like inconveniences. Um, I, I'm really fortunate that my, 
for example, like my mom is extremely liberal and my dad is wildly conservative, but they grew up and raised us. Both of them grew up in households that promoted conversation and they raised us to be able to make our own decisions and to have these conversations and to engage in difficult conversations about policy without name calling. And so my dad, you know, although truthfully, he fully agrees with all of this. He's not your typical conservative. Um, I'm really lucky that my family didn't disown me. I'm really lucky that, you know, we can engage in these conversations and that I, I get to, to talk about this. And, and truthfully, even though there are some sacrifices, small and inconvenient, like that is nothing compared to um, what Breonna Taylor went through. That is nothing compared to Trayvon Martin. That is nothing compared to Marcus Dion Smith in Greensboro. So, you know, I haven't had to sacrifice my life. So the answer is no. <laughs> but you've never been shoved or sprayed or detained. <laughs> <It's bad>. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have found myself hurting. You've hurt people. <laughs> <laughs> I have not hurt people, but I have found myself being hurt. <laughs> um, no, it is. It's hard to hurt somebody who's in riot gear. And truthfully, I am, I am an empathetic speed bump in the middle of the road. Like, I, thank you so much for running over me. It has been a pleasure. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a pacifist. I do not believe in violence. I tend to um, try to use my white body. This is going to sound so... Oh God, it, it sounds so pretentious and, and um, whatever the opposite of humble is, self, self-centered. But I try to use my white body more as a shield <laughs> than as a, as a riot. It's not, it's not, I think that for a lot of people in my position on the front lines, it's not our job to express anger. Um, it's also not my job to stop the expression of anger. So my only job there is to try to protect and to stand and to use my privilege as a means of helping other people not get hurt or to be on the front line as somebody who can offer first aid, for example. Um, my friends and I would go down with huge backpacks of just solution to pour into people's eyes and extra t-shirts and extra masks and anything that we can do to to help pull people out of the rubble because Although it is, it's everyone's fight and it is everybody's fight. It, it also shouldn't be our fight because it's not our anger that really needs to be heard right now. So it's a, it's a, it's a difficult line. But to answer your question, yes, <laughs> we, have been, we have been pepper sprayed. We have been shot out with rubber bullets. We have walked miles and miles and miles. We have calluses on our feet. We have been outside every single day for weeks on end um those sacrifices have been difficult those aren't sacrifices though those aren't sacrifices so how do you practice self-care <laughs> cold showers <laughs> really cold showers oh man you know what I would tell my 15 year old self after I came back from my first protest where I was like maced? I didn't know that we should take a cold shower instead of a hot shower. And so then I took a hot shower and all my pores opened and then it was just burning everywhere. So, um, <laughs> cold showers, um, warm candles, lots of art. Not everybody was made to be on the front line. And I don't think that I'm one of those people. I think like even the army needs chefs, you know? So um, I'm, I'm great at taking care of other people. And I think that my role in this is to continue to do that. It doesn't feel good to be outside every day protesting, but it does feel good to offer refuge when people who have more courage than I do go outside every day to protest. So I've been finding a lot of my strength from cooking and playing music and, and offering a safe space and listening, gener listening generously and, and um, continuing to take care of the people who take care of me. I don't know. <laughs> Self-care is probably something we could all use a little bit more of, if I'm being honest. <laughs> it's not something we put a lot of effort into. <laughs> I agree. I agree. 
So at this point, after COVID ends, what's, what's going to be the next first thing you, you do? Probably some self-care. <laughs> um, I have a really good friend. I spent a lot of time in Italy um, studying abroad and like traveling around Europe has been really great for me. I think that I, um, the minute that I can leave <laughs> and travel again and sort of um, take a break and disconnect and unplug from it all, I think that I'll still be doing work and thinking about work and, and trying to discover more of what it means to be a human trying to express. But um, maybe with a little bit lower stakes. <laughs> so, so I think, I think I will travel. I think the first thing that I will do, like the minute that the European border is open again and the European Union says, yes, you may come, I will be somewhere in Northern Italy, <laughs> probably Torino. Okay. So what do you think about the international protests of Black Lives Matter? Mm, let's talk about it. You gonna make a connection? Yes, yeah. Yes, we're very quick too. Um, we've been really fortunate that with Imani Works, who, uh, like I said earlier, is our fiscal sponsor with House of Blacks. Uh, she's actually a consultant for the UN and we plan on continuing the, in that tradition. Um, and as quickly as I can get to New York for a UN meeting, I, I absolutely plan on being there. That is another huge step for us after COVID ends, just not necessarily for the self-care purposes. Um, but the we are very passionate about making sure that this is continued internationally. That is why one of our colleagues and co-founders, Maya, is in Israel right now. Um, the, the Black Lives Matter movement, especially, oh, especially in the UK and places like Ireland, Germany, France, it's, it's really valuable to us that we continue to have those conversations globally. And um, we really intend on the minute that we can continue traveling, making those connections internationally. I think it, and now more than ever, it is vital because we have this beautiful um, flow of media that happens and we get to have these conversations. But like I said before, you know, unless you're really standing in front of somebody experiencing that flood of empathy, it's, it's difficult to make those connections. So that is absolutely at the, at the top of our list, yes. So we talked a little bit about technology. Mm. How do you all use technology in your work? Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in every way, shape, and form. I, even having conversations like this would be impossible right now without without technology. Um, the the share of information is what's most important to us. So on our website, being able to have infographics and all of our, you know, the data available, the constant spreadsheets of resources each month has its topic and each topic comes with a list of resources, not just about articles that you can read, uh, peer reviewed um, journals that will help back up information, but then also just like, if you've been a victim of these things, what resources can you, can you find and, and use in order to make your life even 5% better? Because who doesn't want to be 5% better? Um, and then, so our website's been a huge, huge hub for us. It's a place where we get to, celebrate you know the artists that are doing good work right now it's been a place where we get to um, help facilitate difficult conversations and exciting conversations i keep saying difficult it's not difficult to have these conversations it's exciting and important um and then the the ability to collaborate right now especially as a musician the fact that like i can sit in my living room and and somebody sitting in palestine can record a piece of music and send it to me and then I can play over it and manipulate it and then record over it and then we can have a conversation about it while we're both listening to it and then I can send it back to them for them to master I, like that collaboration has been absolutely invaluable to us and do you do and that to be able to sound soundcloud or iMovie or all kinds of things um we do well there's a lot of different like music editing softwares that we use um and including with the podcast too where we record our podcast we get to have international guests um, and we recorded a podcast with somebody in Chicago and, you know, all kinds of different places. It happens a lot over Zoom, over Google Hangout, in, inside of G Suite. We have almost all of our meetings uh, in G Suite now because we can't be next to each other. I'm immunocompromised. I guess that's one of the 
difficult things about going outside and protesting right now during the age of COVID that has a whole nother layer to this, but who cares? Being sick doesn't matter. <laughs> um, uh, the, the impetus for everything that we do right now is really surrounded by, um, by media and also just like the sharing art, you know, like photography and digital art and, and um, graphic design and things like that, that can all be really, really helpful for marketing the House of Wax in the way that we're looking forward to doing it and, and working with the BLM movement and like we, so we're at, we, we, we would really like to incorporate as a chapter of BLM as the first exclusively artist chapter of BLM. So, you know, having those digital resources available to us so that we can make a portfolio that we can send out to people is, is really invaluable. And it happens in lots of different ways, but TBH, I'm a little bit illiterate when it comes, inept even, <laughs> when it comes to technology. <laughs> I'm not in charge. <laughs> well, have you thought about ways to monetize all of your talents so that you can continue to financially support and sustain the work that you're doing? Yeah, we've been very fortunate that um, some of the work that we're doing has been easily fundable by individual artist grants. Um, each of us being artists, we get to apply for individual grants while we're working on our EIN and the trademark and whatnot. Uh, and we do have somebody helping us working on operational grants as well. We want not, uh, we, we really firmly believe that artists deserve to be compensated for the work that they do, but we also really firmly believe that there shouldn't be a paywall for any of this because the whole point of uh, sharing ideas and expressing freely is to make this as tangible and accessible as possible. So it's hard to, to walk that line between wanting to stand on the moral ground of being able to feed artists because we deserve, you know, it is work, but then also um, not having any kind of paywall up for any of the work that we're doing because that is completely and entirely antithetical to what our mission and vision is. So yes and no, we're in, we're in the middle. <laughs> it's truly about taking a, it's a little bit of Robin Hood trying to find ways to take money from the people who have money to give and using that to benefit the people who need the resources. Agreed. It's not that easy. I agree. I agree. We're That's, trying. I, I'm, I'm seeing this concert, this, you know, this concert series of artists and swag. It's on the list. <laughs> it's on the list. It's on the list. It's on the list. You know, I think that the, the demonstrations absolutely will be free and we plan on, you know, having grants for those so that we can pay the artists and still make the demonstrations available. Um, the galleries and things like that, maybe a donate as you're, as you're able to, um, uh, but still available to be free. The, you know, I think that, and we're, we're every month. So as you know, with these topics, I know this idea keeps expanding uh, things I keep forgetting to include every month has a small EP that's being released and then the, at the end of each year a few songs from each topic and each EP that's released will be put onto a larger album that will be released under our um, label's name and things like that so that's all very good and exciting um, but it is it's a weird in between trying to figure out how to um, keep the message alive and still feed ourselves <laughs> and pay our bills. <laughs> but also all of us are artists. If we were in this for the money, we probably would have gone into plumbing instead. So <laughs> I think it's a, I think it's, I, I think it's just a reality that we've come to accept. We knew what we were getting into. Absolutely. Absolutely. So where do you see yourself in five years? Five years? Uh, we'll be five albums in. <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah, it's a tricky one. Uh, I'm hopefully in Italy. <laughs> I I think I think all of us are really interested in traveling and, go, and going abroad. I, I think in five years we'll f we'll have five albums. We will have done at that point hopefully. 15 to 20 galleries um at that point hopefully we also will have taken the idea concept of black elm street that protest um to other cities and 
hopefully done an entire, at least one, I would like to see at least one entire year of programming, um, potentially two entire years of programming. Maybe I can hope for two years <laughs> of programming, but that's really dependent on, on, um, on COVID for the, for the pop-up series shows around the country. And um, I would really, really like to see us, I think maybe it's a 10-year plan, but hopefully five-year plan being consultants for the UN and advocating for the, for the right to culture and continuing on that path. That's, uh, that's my own personal goal. That's not necessarily a House of Wax goal, but that's very much a personal goal for me. Okay. Those are admirable goals. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, I'm just so grateful that we're having this conversation. I'm, I'm I, grateful that you're sharing all of this valuable information for prosperity. I mean, you're, we're gonna look at this and, and it's going to be such an influence to so many people. Mm. Thank you so much. I hope so. Thank you. No, I, I really hope so. I hope it's helpful. And, and I'm, I can't stress this enough. We're, we're just like so happy to be here. Our child selves on the inside are celebrating. It feels like we're the, um, I feel like I'm the adult I wanted to be when I was a little kid. So I'm, I'm very excited and humbled and honored and, and grateful and a little teary. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an emotional sap. <laughs> I, I'm, um, just, I'm just in awe. I'm thank in awe. You. I hope that you get to talk to everybody else. I don't know if you've had any luck getting in contact with, with everybody I, else. In I've, the been, house. I've been uh, emailed uh, tagging with Virginia. I think we are okay. trying to uh, get together on Zoom probably early next week. Okay. Justin's been extremely... Any, can you suggest anyone else that, that may be yes. interested? Yes. Well, I know Selena and Justin are both extremely interested in talking to you. Selena, uh -huh. our powerhouse of a woman, um, had orientation this week for her first semester of grad school, so she's a little busy. And Justin was doing and both he, his TED Talk and the book. Is it Berkeley? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> I can't tell you, I'm so proud. Um, I think Virginia is going back to school too to finish her undergrad at UNCG in political science and communications. So I'm, I, we're, we're really, cannot begin to tell you, we are thriving. Um, but Justin's really interested in speaking to you and so is Jelena, uh, Selena. And I, I, I think will- think you're kind of splitting them up, like who's gonna interview what, so I have to look and see who's tagged. But you know, I, I wanna talk to everybody. <laughs> Um, yeah, please, if I, if I can, if I can be helpful, if I can CC you two on emails or if there's anybody else in the city that you'd like to talk to that Absolutely. comes to mind. Anybody that comes to mind, you just feel free to share my information. <laughs> I will. Have we have, me. yeah, we have all kinds of resources that I would love to make available. Great. Well, how can we help you? Keep doing this. <laughs> I truly, I've. I'm so grateful for the archives and for, for oral history is the most important thing for us is that we don't separate the artist from the art because the the most important thing is is not just to look at a piece and to come to our own conclusions. And I do believe that like, you know, books belong to their readers and we can draw our own value out of things. But I think right now, the reason that we're making art and the reason that artists are feeling so convicted and the reason that these things are happening is the most important thing. So being able to have these oral histories especially from the artists, people like Justin and Virginia, I think is, is so entirely invaluable. And I cannot wait to go back and listen to all of these and to maybe curate a gallery where we can have the oral histories next to um, the pieces. I think that would be really special. And that is our intent. So in, in concluding this interview and just wrapping up once again, I wanna say thank you for no, sharing no. all of your insight all of this information, your passion, yeah. your, your fervor, you. your commitment. I mean, I'm, I'm just in awe. Thank and you. I thank you humbly for thank just, you. you know, taking the time to speak to us and just for the record, just to clarify, you know, all that you've gone through and, and all of your influences and why you're inspired to keep doing what you're doing. It's been surreal. Thank you very much. I appreciate this. This is, it's been a full circle moment for me today. <laughs> it sounds like it. <laughs> sounds like uh, well, thank you. I hope that you feel better. And that oh, I could be fine. You know, it's, I think 
what it's like a lot of dust and then the air conditioner oh. and, you know like all that the particles and so i woke I get up this it. morning and i was like oh <laughs> i get it i i woo, i get it <laughs> I've been to the doctor like four times this week for all kinds of things, but I hope that you continue to feel better. Well, thank you. And I hope that you continue to stay safe and continue to be well, because we need you. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, I don't know. If we We're need all you. taking our vitamins. You know, we, we all had to be here. Got to be safe. Truly, truly. It's a marathon. So <laughs> thank you very much. I hope that you have a great day. Thank you. And have a great weekend. Thank you. I'm going to go to sleep. <laughs> we'll let you know if we come up with anything else. Thank you so much, Savannah. Have a great day. Of course. Okay. Bye-bye.